All righty, everyone. Good evening and welcome to Planning a Garden with Native Plants, brought to you by Loudoun County Public Library and the Loudoun Wildlife Conservancy. I'm Lorraine Maffa, Programming Coordinator for Loudoun County Public Library and the host for tonight's program. Please feel free to send me any questions or comments you have during the program, and I'll be happy to relay them to our presenter. And it's my pleasure to introduce that presenter. Julie Borman is president of the Loudoun Wildlife Conservancy and the owner of Watermark Woods Native Plants in Hamilton. She is a certified horticulturist and lifelong learner who takes daily inspiration from nature, her customers, and her peers. Applying her knowledge to benefit the environment is what makes Julie a top local expert in the native plant world. Welcome, Julie. Thanks, Lorraine. Hi, everyone. Welcome to tonight's talk. Um, I hope everybody had a chance to get outside today and uh, enjoy this weather. Holy cow, was it nice? Um, I was. I did find this. Let's see if you guys can see that. I mean, by the way, maybe a better background, but that's Pussy Willow. And it is a little bit, um, it's almost, you know, it's coming out. That's what we all know, these little soft catkins that come out. And you can see here's one that's closed and they burst open and you get the soft ones. And that's one of the um, predictors that spring is coming. You know, we can all look at the groundhog, but I think this is a much more pleasant one, much more reliable. And it says that spring's coming. So I hate listening to the groundhog. Um, but pussy willow, this is um, Salix discolor, which is our native pussy willow. It is um, a great plant for sun to part shade. It likes moisture, but I have mine growing on the top of a hill, so it's very well drained and it's huge. They can get to be 25 feet tall or so. These, um, the little puffy things turn into little yellow flowers and the pollen comes off of there. And I have bees on it year round because there's something in the stems too that they like. And so it's a great, great plant for pollinators. One of the first things to bloom in the spring. Uh, so I just thought you might enjoy that little bit of phenology tonight and uh, to know that spring is coming. So have hope. So we're going to get started here and I apologize because my uh, slide advancer goes very slow. So we'll see if it will advance for me tonight. Um, I just wanted to say many, many thanks to um, both Loud and Wildlife and the library for hosting us tonight because it is uh, always fun to talk plants. Now I'm not going forward at all. There we go. There's slide two. See, that took forever. It always happens. So tonight we're going to talk about uh, planting your garden. Uh, I'm going to go over some tools for planning because that can be really helpful. We don't know where to start a lot of times. Um, some things to consider when you're planting, how to choose plants and how to re-choose plants because having a garden and, or yard, landscaping, whatever, it's not just throwing everything in and being like, okay, it's good, you know, and you forget about it. You know, it's a long time maintenance. You've got to keep these things up. You've got to continually edit your yards. And one of the, um, Common questions we get in the nursery, I'll probably say, you know, this happens a lot in the nursery because that's that's my experience. Um, but in the nursery, everybody comes in, they say, I want low maintenance, I want no maintenance, I want evergreen, I want it to flower all year long. I want, you know, just, it's gonna look beautiful forever. Well, tame your expectations and really think about what you want in a plant, what's gonna look good in the plant, but also how that plant's gonna contribute to the environment. And we're gonna go through some tools tonight that can help you to do that and think about all those things. So the first tool I wanted to tell you about because it's local is the Loudon Web Logis system. And the website is logis, L-O-G-I-S dot Loudon dot gov, gov, sorry, um, slash web logis, W-E-B-L-O-G-I-S slash. So you can also just, type in to Google Loudoun County mapping and you'll find it. That's much easier. But you can see um, on here, I don't know if you can see my pointer or not. Um, hopefully you can. Uh, but on here on the left of your screen, the tip is to click on that base layers and that will show you imagery and you can um, drill down. There's a little slider bar here. You can drill down and zoom into your site your where you live 
or you can click on the search bar up here and it will let you search um, based on your location, your address, and you type that in, it'll bring up your property. If you get really good at it, there's some tools that'll even measure for you, which is really cool. So I think that that's a really good uh, local tool that we have that everybody should be using. Um, it's also kind of fun to get in there and poke around. You can see who has or has not paid their property taxes and crazy stuff like that, but it's neat because you can look at his historically as well. Um, when I drill down on my land, I can see that it was once used as farmland as a grazing pasture land. And so that might um, influence a little bit what I plant or how I plant or what I'm looking for when I'm uh, working in my yard. It could take two hours here if my screen doesn't start uh, <laughs> start advancing a little faster. All right, you know what I'm going to do here? Oh, there it is. But you know what I'm going to do is I think I'm going to we're going to do this a little bit backwards. Lorraine, can you still see that slide? Uh, right now, I just see a white screen. Oh. Okay. Well, we'll go back then. All right, so this is, uh, I wanted to show you a little bit of why we, we should think about and plan our yards. This is a, a yard uh, with builder plants, and I'm guessing the homeowner probably put a, a little guard, a little stool there. Um, but one of the tools I use allows me to look at what's that gonna look like in 10 years, five years. So there's two Leland Cypress there and they grow really fast. You are not gonna see that bench in a few years. And that other tree that's there, boy, it's going to be hard to see that one as well. So, so if you think about it, you know, those builder plants we put in, you know, they're, they're going to grow and we have to accommodate for that. Here's another planting where this little holly tree at the corner, you know, in a few years, look how big that's going to be. And it's going to be encroaching on that house. We're not so, seeing that, Julie. You're not seeing it at all? No, it's just no. white. Okay, there we go. You see it now? Yeah, we're seeing it in a few years that. Okay. okay. And it's a gray house with the shrub on the corner? Yes. Okay. All right. So in a few years, that's going to be touching the house and it could cause potential problems with siding and it blocking the window there and the gutter. It's probably going to cause debris to go in the gutter. And then it's a nice little ladder for the raccoons and whoever to go up there and live in the house. But if you move it out just a little bit, think about what it's going to look like in a few years. Um, you can really, uh, really make a big impact because when you move a tree that size, it's not easy. So I also, in this one, um, I added some plants in there so you can see what they're going to look like when they're mature. And we can go over those plants later and talk about some of my favorite plants when we talk about plant choices. But I also think about what those plants are going to look like in all the different seasons so that I have different growth colors and whatever there. So the tool that I use to do that is called Garden Puzzle. Um, and I'm going to talk about just a couple of my favorite tools that are low or no cost. I think this one has a small fee um, that you pay once. It's a one-time software thing, and it's got all sorts of different shrubs. You can plop a picture of your house in there, and it asks you, you know, what uh, what's the scale so that you can get a good representation. And it'll also show you um, you can click through different seasons. So that's kind of a fun one called Garden Puzzle, gardenpuzzle.com. I get no kickbacks from these. These are just things that I found that I liked. Um, and there's another view of things that you can do with that. And there is a free demo. So if you have an idea of what you want to do, you could get the demo for a few days, 30 days, I think it is, and then cancel it. Um, the other one that I like is Garden Planner, and that gives you more of a, a drawn look to your yard or to your things rather than a, a picture with pictures of the plants. That's more of your like, this is what your landscape architect is going to come up with. Uh, so really what I think is best is to just go old school and you really just need your pen and paper, colored pencils, and I really, really like tracing paper. So if you need three tools to do a garden plan, it would be graph paper, tracing paper, and pencils or colored pencils. And we're gonna go through kind of how, how this works. So 
things that we're going to consider when we do this plan are this actual site that's going to be our base layer, what kind of soils you have, water, and light. So the first thing you're going to do is on your graph paper come up with a drawing like, like this with a footprint of your buildings and your paved surfaces. You're gonna draw maybe where your utilities are. Very important to know where north is. And scale, um, scale is helpful, but also writing in your measurements is helpful. We get a lot of drawings like this come into the nursery and it's kind of funny because you're like, well, how big is that area between the sidewalk and the driveway in the house? And they're like, oh, I don't know. It's maybe from here to, you know, where you're standing. So, you know, it's it's really hard to help people when they have drawings like that. So if you can come up with measurements, that's really, really helpful. So that would all be on your base layer on your graph paper and, uh, you know, draw in everything you can. It's not shown here, but you could draw in where your HVAC unit is, maybe where your mailbox is, maybe where the kids like to cut through your yard. Um, Maybe where your windows are, that would be another good thing to note on there. So that, and how high off the ground your windows are. So all those things are really helpful. Then this next part, we're gonna put on to tracing paper so that you can lay it over your um, initial paper, your graph paper, and you're not drawing on your, all that hard work you did to measure your house and figure out where everything is. You're gonna put in some of your existing vegetation so any big trees, um, anything that you want to keep. If there's things you want to rip out, you don't have to put those on here. Um, but you can put everything that exists. And, you know, it's fun to color it in. But uh, let's see. And put the name of what you have and what size it is now and if it's a healthy plant. If you have, you know, a, an oak tree there and it's not doing so well, it might be worthwhile to note that because maybe it's getting, you know, not enough water or something and we could help fix that by planting other things around there to shade the roots so that, you know, they're not getting too much sun and drying out and, and whatever. Uh, so that would be your second uh, sheet and it would be on tracing paper. And then on top of that, we're gonna do the soils and that's gonna show, you can see they have the compacted soil there up on the top left of that drawing. That's probably where people are walking to and from the shed. Um, low area commonly wet it doesn't have to be you know great artistry but it's very important information you know if we have a wet area it might be a great area a spot for a rain garden we know to pick wet plants there um, exposed rock if you've got a spot that's really like dry and rocky you know that's important to know so you can you can find all this information by just hanging out in your yard winter is a great time to do it because there's not a lot of vegetation around Yesterday I went for a walk and noticed, you know, noticed the areas where my shoes got muddy. So that was really helpful. Even in winter, you know, we can make all these observations. Um, you can go to that Loudoun County web logis as well. And in one of the layers, there is soils and you can tell, it'll tell you, you have shale limestone. And there are some plants that do well in that and some that don't do well. So that might be really important to know as well. Julie, I'm sorry to interrupt, yeah. but can you tell us one more time what the name of this tool is? It's the Loudoun County Mapping System, and it's okay. the, the real term is WebLogis, W-E-B-L-O-G-I-S, and it's on the Loudoun.gov website. And when I go to it, I always, I just go to the Google bar and type in Loudoun Mapping, and it always comes up. It's one of the first three things that comes up in the Google search. All right, after we get our soils mapped, we want to look at the water, where water, where we get water from, your downspouts, your spigots, um, and where the water flows, where water collects. You can also really take it to the next level and calculate how much um, impervious surface you have, you know, how much water is coming off your roof. That roof doesn't soak water in, it all flows off of there. So how much water are you getting off of your roof? You could collect it in a rain barrel, that would, you know, you could use later, or you could know where to direct your downspout, or it might be helpful to figure out why you're getting water pooling in certain areas. And when it rains, watch, you know, go out there and look and see, is this downspout, you know, just really overwhelmed and really spitting out water like crazy? Or is the downspout overflowing in a certain area? Maybe that's why it's wet. 
So, you know, there's a lot that you can see when you're, when it's raining and after two or three days after a rain, go out there and look as well, see where it's holding water. Very important. And this, this would also be on your tracing paper. So you could put all these layers on and kind of get, get a full picture, but you can put layer, you know, one layer on and then the other layer on, or, you know, take one off. I just want to look at water now, or I want to look at where the soil is. But you've got your base drawing on your uh, graph paper, so you don't have to worry about messing it up when you draw all this stuff on. So the next thing you're going to think about is light and energy. And this is probably, I think, the most important one, you know, barring all the things it says on there, like locate the following, you know, windows, doors, AC units, whatever. Um, this is the sun. You know, we all know plants need sun to live a certain amount, some not very much, some a lot. But look at where the sun is coming from. You can go out and look now and just know that, um, I think I've got another slide that shows where the sun is summer versus winter. But even now, you can go out in the winter, see where the sun is, what area of your yard's getting the most sun. Um, and when you're looking at that, um, take into consideration the um, reflections. So if you look at this house in the front, they've got that window. So it says full sun. But more than likely, they're getting some reflection off of that window of sun of light. So it's probably more than full sun. Uh, it's it's it can be surprising when you really look at it to see where the light is and how much light some things are getting. And also think about too when you're in a full sun spot like that. Some of those plants, if you're if you have a uh, a brick house. <laughs> If you're with three little pigs in a brick house, then you're getting that house is holding heat and that soil is getting really warm. So you've got this microclimate there that is probably not very similar to many things in nature. So you really want to look at, you know, plants that can take a lot of heat and probably even dry. And the winds, you can look at winds, you know, look at the lay of the land, you know, cold air flows down. So if you're in a low lying area, um, you're you're going to have a much cooler area, a cooler spot. I know, like, if you've ever been to our nursery, you go down a little hill, and that's where the barn and shop is. And it stays a couple degrees cooler down there than anywhere else in our yard. And so I know that, you know, plants on certain spots in the nursery aren't going to wake up as fast as other plants because while they're still getting sun, the soil is not warming up as fast because it takes a lot longer to get that cold air, air out of there because it's in a low lying area. So here's a, just a good, good representation of, you know, here we are mid February. So about halfway between that March and December line, and we're probably 25 or 30 degrees. The sun is probably 25 or 30 degrees lower than it would be in June in the middle of summer. So if you, you know, you can kind of gauge based on what we know of the sun's degree uh, angle, that's the word I'm looking for, angle, um, what it's going to be like in summer and, and what your sunlight's going to be like in summer. So here's just a little representation of what that looks like. This is, this method is taken from the Landscape for Life um, uh, program that is by the Lady Bird Johnson Wildflower Center, and they do teach a full class on this. I think it do think it costs money, um, but you can take that class and they really dig into these different layers. But, you know, it's nice because if you don't like it, you just crumple it up, start again, but you've got your base measurements and the hard work done and you're not redrawing everything. It seems simple, but it's just genius. Is there any questions about that process? What was the class called? It's called Landscape for Life. Is that in the chat? No other questions so far. Okay. So I'm going to back up just one thing. When you once you get this process done and you're kind of ready to lay it lay it out in your yard, just a few tips, things you can do. Um, you know, you can go out with spray paint and you know, they have that upside down spray paint and make marks in your grass and look at it for a few days, kind of get comfortable with with where you're putting things. Um, a great tip that I found is to use your garden hose. Just lay that out as the like where the edge of your garden bed would be. And it's nice because I don't like straight right angles. 
Um, they're hard to mow around. <laughs> and I just don't think they look as nice as a soft curve, swooping curve. And your garden hose will do that. So you can use your garden hose, lay it out in your yard, and, and it'll tell you where your garden beds are going to go. And you can leave it there for a few days and get a feel for it. You know, do I like where this is? And move it a little bit, wiggle it around before you start, you know, ripping up grass or changing things. Um, it's good to do this too. You could go through this process, you know, now, and you could do it again in five years and see how things have changed and uh, inventory what's done well, maybe what what you could do better. So, part of planning is choosing your plants, and the, there's a lot of things you could have to think about, and they're all those things that we put on those papers: the light, moisture, soil any microclimates and how much space you have. I can't emphasize enough how much important space is and taking your measurements. Um, so once you, when you're thinking, choosing plant material, there's some terms you're gonna run across and some terms that I want you to know. So annual and perennial are two really common terms that people get confused by. And, and annual means that the plant completes its growing life, growing life cycle in one season. So those are like your exotic pansies and petunias. They don't come back every year. There's a couple of natives that are annuals. Um, we grow one in the nursery. Um, uh, David, who works here, is his favorite for blue curls. Um, it's, it's an annual. It doesn't come back every year. But it self-seeds pretty well. So, you know, it might be worth having in your yard. It's got blue flowers, which are pretty, pretty showy. And then perennial means that it takes many seasons. So it just lasts, you know, a long time and some last longer than others. Plants all have lifespans just like humans do. Um, some things, you know, that you see in your yard seem to last forever, you know, 70 years, 100 years. Um, but some plants, you know, only live four or five years, you know, and some of that's just because of the way our ecology works. You know, some plants live there and then as other plants move in, they die out. You know, some of those aggressive plants are good at colonizing in the beginning, then they die away and something else takes over. So it's important to think about stuff like that. How long is this plant going to live? Um, native plants, which, you know, we're, what we're, we're all thinking about and how to plan, uh, plan for native plants in your yard is important because of the um, importance it is to our ecology. Um, but, you know, when you think about native plants, there's either there's native plants, there's exotic plants, ornamental, invasive. Those are all terms they use. Native means that it's indigenous to here. It's evolved here over thousand years or whatever. Um, and we would never say a native plant is invasive. We would say it's aggressive. Um, invasive implies that the plant is not from here. It's not indigenous to the area. Um, and an ornamental plant could be either a native or a non-native plant. Um, natives can be very ornamental. So that's kind of just a confusing way to talk about a few terms, but I really um, encourage you all to consider natives and plant natives. You don't have to go 100% native, but you should do as many natives as you can. And these are probably hard to read, um, but Natives, one of the things it says here um, is that the oak tree, and this is from uh, Professor Doug Talamy's work, that he's published a few books and he gives talks all the time in the area, but he's uh, taken some of his grad students, he's an entomologist uh, at the University of Delaware, and he's taken some of his grad students and had them look at different plants to determine which ones have the highest wildlife value. And he found that the oak tree supports more than 530 some species um, of butterflies, moths, and lepidoptera. So that, if you can plant any tree, you have space for it, plant an oak, because that's going to provide the most bang for your buck. And then there's also things, um, everybody, a really common question we get is how do we attract birds to our yard? And birds, shrubs with berries are probably the best things to plant in their yards. One of the shrubs that we have around here a lot that's escaped cultivation and is not native is the multiflora rose. And it has 0.9% uh, fat. And so the birds need high fat around here. And But our native bayberry, which is micro, um, Myrica pensylvanica, has 50% fat in the berry. So that's just one small example of why it's important to plant these plants. Um, I like to plant 
for birds outside of my windows so that I can see them coming and going all the time. That's where my pussy willow tree is. And I see the birds coming in there because it's great cover for them. And then they can jump to some of the viburnums or the um, other ones that have the berries. So, you know, thinking about those layers and what the birds like, they need cover to get to their food so the hawks don't pick them off, um, are, are things to think about if, with who you want to attract to your yard. And when you're out shopping for plants, um, you can ask the garden centers, you know, if you're at, at our place, we, everything is of course native, but you know, you, there's a lot of places out there in Loudoun County to shop, um, but not all of them um, are in tune to what native plants are and the detriment that some of those exotic invasive plants can have. And this is a list of plants that I see sold at garden centers still in 2021, they were still sent, selling bamboo and burning bush um, and this whole list. And it's always amazing to me now that I've seen the harm that it can have in um, the environment that places will still sell these. Um, and if, if you have one plant that you can replace in your yard, I would say replace the Nandina. It's a really common landscaping plant. And landscapers love it because it's evergreen, it has berries, it can go in a host of situations, there's tall ones and short ones, but the berries contain cyanide, which are toxic to a lot of our birds. And while they don't prefer it, if it's the only thing they have available, they will certainly eat it and it kills them. So think about replacements for Nandina. So these are um, four websites that I like to use. I'm going to go through each of these when I'm choosing my plant material. So I use all of these a lot uh, when I'm looking up things to sell in the nursery. We just are working on a big backyard project here at my house. And so I've been going through plant lists all winter long, trying to figure out what do I wanna plant back there. And it's really funny because we give people advice all the time in the nursery and I have no problem. You know, someone's like, I need a ground cover. I'm like, oh, check X, Y, and Z, I love these. But now it's my own yard, I can't figure out what to plant. I'm just, I'm at a loss. So I've been perusing these a lot lately. So the first one is the Virginia Plant Atlas. And this is what the screen looks like. And at the top, you, there's a search bar. You can just type in the plant name um, and you have to choose botanical name or common name. So there's a little drop down there that you can click on um, and choose which one you're typing in. If you're kind of a plant nerd, you can click on these pictures here. There's one that's lycophytes and pteridophytes, the gymnosperms, monocots, dicots, bryophytes, if you wanna key out your plant. So that's for the real hardcore plant nerds. I never use that because I, I just go down rabbit holes and I don't get to what, what at all what I want. But once you find your plant, this is what it, the screen looks like in the Virginia Plant Atlas. And the little red dots are counties where the plants are native. So this happens to be a shrub by Burnham dentatum. The birds like it. It's a nice upright shrub that gets eight to 10 feet tall, nice white flowers, and then it has berries for the birds. Its common name is arrowwood viburnum. Um, but you can see it's native in Loudoun County and it's spread widespread throughout um, Virginia. So it's a really, it's a good plant to have but it'll give you really good data on whether or not a plant is native. And then they have these comments about more about the distribution of the plant as opposed to the growing habitat of the plants. Uh, the next one that I wanted to show you is called Plant Nova Natives. They're a nonprofit in Northern Virginia. They made this book here that um, you can see just a little bit of the cover there, Native Plants for Northern Virginia. It's a good primer of native plants it's got kind of the basics. We sell it at the nursery and all the profits go back to Plant Nova Natives. It is for free on the website. If you go there, you can download the book. But they also, if you scroll below this, um, there's a, a plant finder and you can type, put in there different um, habitats or characteristics and search for plants there as well. So that's a really nice one. It's a nonprofit, so, so I like them. Um, oh, I skipped one, I think. Um, which one did I skip? The USDA. So when I'm looking for the USDA, um, I'm not gonna bring up their website because it is kind of hard to navigate. I usually search for my plant name space USDA and that brings me to the plant. And it has very similar information. Let's see if I, 
uh, have one down here. I thought I had a picture of it, but I guess not. But similar information to the Virginia Plant Atlas. So uh, that's another nice one to use. If you don't live in Virginia or property elsewhere, it shows you um, the whole country. So you can see county, if it's native down to a county throughout uh, any state. So some things I'd like to see, you know, because we're kind of on the border with Maryland, if a plant is native all in Maryland and other counties in Virginia, but maybe not Loudoun, my logic tells me it's probably found in Loudoun, it just wasn't cataloged there. So I might be okay with growing that. The last site is my own site. And um, this is new, my son just made this website and I think it is fantastic. So I wanted to show it to you a little bit, um, but you can type in a plant name and hit filter, but you can type in if you I want a shrub or a tree. You can mm -hmm. also put in the water, but the best part about this is plant deer resistant. So you can see if deer eat the plant or not, because that has gotta be the number one question I get when I give to a talk. When people come into the nursery, everybody wants to know what, what should I plant because the deer eat all my plants. Well, you can type in here and say specifically, I want plants that the deer rarely browse and it will give you um, a list of deer resistant plants. And you can also see what's in stock. So if you wanna come out, you can get your shopping list ready. Um, and you, if you click on the plant, it gives you all the information, growing conditions, characteristics of the plant. Uh, we tried to make it really helpful. So, you know, you can take this and, and shop with me or anybody else is fine. My goal is to get native plants out there, not specifically for me to sell them to you, but I want you to plant natives. Um, but it is a good tool and I think uh, we put a lot of work into it. So hopefully you'll find that useful. So I wanted to give you just a couple of examples for inspiration. Um, my, I told you about my garden project in the backyard. Part of it's gonna be stairs coming down a hill. And this is one of my inspiration photos. This is from the Landscape for Life class. So it's not my photo. Um, and it's funny because they did post this photo um, with the class at Love and Wildlife. And we got a lot of comments that people liked the Russian sage. And I'm not sure if that's Russian sage or not there, that purple plant but it looks, it could be, it could also be um, Agastache or Hyssop, which is a native purpley plant, but they have planted a lot of plants for pollinators in there. Um, to the left, there's a puffy pink thing that is Joe Pie weed, which does great in moist um, part shade to shade. They put some grasses in there. So there's a lot of things in there for pollinators, a lot of color, but there's a lot of structure as well. And I really like when people are planting things that they think about the structure of their yard. So they've got some trees in the back. It looks like Virginia white pines back there. Um, so, and those are evergreen. So they've got something interesting there all year round. But one of the other things that they did is they added this grass kind of on the left in the midfield. It's the tan color. I'm not sure what the grass is, but a big blue or little blue stem might be a nice grass in there as well as, uh, what else would I put in there? Sea oats maybe, but those grasses stay all year long and they look like that even in the winter. You know, they turn brown, but there's something there in the winter. And so that's so fantastic for the birds because when, if we get a good hard snow like we haven't seen in a long time, uh, but those grasses are poking up and those seeds are fantastic bird food. But it's just such great habitat there. There's a non-native hosta in there, which, you know, I won't begrudge anyone a hosta because I like them as well, but they're not native. But there's, you know, so much to be gotten from inspiration photos like this. Here's another one along a walkway. Um, this is at, I believe it's at Mount Cuba Center, and they do a lot of planting with natives. They do combine natives and non-natives, but there's, um, you know, they planned, there's, this is probably a late spring. On the left, it looks like there's uh, some pussy toes growing there. There's some Stokes Aster in there, bee balm. Um, the yellow in the foreground is sun drops. So they've got a lot of colors going on there. Some people will come in and they want all one color and, or complementary colors. I had a lady come in once with her color wheel. 
which I thought was cute. She only wanted complimentary colors in her garden. Um, another neat thing about this garden, if you look in the back on the top left, you can see there's like a structure and a bench. So there's a little, I don't know, like one a wind spinner or something. Those, those little touches, especially like a wind spinner in your garden or a statuary or something like that, they add a lot of intention. So if you're worried about things looking messy, you could put a path through it like we saw with the stairs or you could add a structure and that helps a lot to make your garden look intentional. Here's another one. Um, shoot, I forget who did this photo, but um, you know, there's a, a lot of planning went in there and they, I guarantee you they do a lot of weeding in that yard because it's all planting. There's no grass at all, no mowing. Um, it looks like there's probably some annuals in there as well. So they complement their natives with annual plants, which is just fine. So a few of my favorite ground covers, because I think underutilized in your yard is ground covers. Um, if you have mulch, it's just an opportunity to put some ground cover in. And ground covers do great because they keep the soil cool for the roots of the larger plants. They fill things in and they really cut down on the maintenance. So I'm going to go, I'm just going to go through top to top, left to right. We're going to start at the top with green and gold. It's kind of, there's a couple different um, cultivars of this. So a cultivar is a named variety that is cultivated for a specific trait. So there's some that stay mounding, there's some that will spread out more, but green and gold is mostly evergreen. So it'll stay very green, unless we have a snow or really long cold snap, it'll turn kind of a brown to red. Uh, but it gets flowers like this heavy in the spring, like you see in the picture. And then all summer long, you get a flower here or there. So it's a really good ground cover. It looks really good with asters that bloom in the fall. Um, and, you know, it just, I love, I love green and gold. People love green and gold. We can't keep it in stock. It's a fantastic plant. It's, it's very polite spreader though. It's not going to take off and take over things. Unlike the next one, which is golden ground cell, Pacara aurea. Um, those are yellow flowers in the spring. It's one of the first things to flower really good for pollinators because they need those early season flowers. It is a heavy spreader. It spreads everywhere and it spreads like crazy. It has little airborne seeds and so it'll spread around a lot, but it's really easy to pull out. So if you don't like it, you can just pull it. But I like it. I planted six, six plants and in three years, it probably filled an area about half the size that we see there. And, and that's in someone's front yard. And I think that's a house in Ashburn that I saw not too long ago. And it just was stunning. And it's evergreen. It has big glossy leaves that look cool. So it does a lot to make your yard look clean, I think. So the right uh, American ginger is great. It really likes to be under a tree. It's, mm, I wouldn't say it's evergreen though, but it, it's a nice spreader. It fills in pretty dense but it's very slow to establish. But when you get a nice group of it, it looks really pretty. And it does get little um, magenta, not magenta, maroon flowers underneath the leaves. They can be hard to see, but they're very pretty. Okay, and then on the bottom left is our, one of, I think only three native sedums. And this one is the easiest to grow. It gets these white, black and white, or white flowers with little flecks of like pepper on them. And it is uh, an, a good spreader. And whenever a piece breaks off, I just stick it in the ground and it grows. It's really, it's a very nice one. Um, the the middle, bottom middle has the wrong name on it. It says it's uh, pol Phlox pelosa, but it is Tiarella cordifolia. And there are clumping versions and, and running versions that'll spread faster, but it is beautiful. It has these really beautiful leaves. The leaves can be ranged anywhere from like a mottled pink and green to this variegated maroon and green that you see there. Very, very fragrant. The hummingbirds will use it, butterflies, bees, everybody loves it. And then the bottom right is um, an aster. Asters and um, flocks 
or I don't have any flocks on here, but it's another great ground cover. Love them. This one is called Woods Pink, which is a lower growing aster. There's a Woods Pink, Woods Purple, and Woods Blue. So it can give you a variety of colors in there, but they bloom in the fall. So nice fall blooming ground cover, stays low. Uh, late season flowers. So that's really good for our late season and migratory pollinators. And then Phlox has a similar look and it's evergreen. There's a low growing one that's Phlox subdulata that comes in every color under the sun. And, and asters and Phlox, there's one for any situation in your yard. So if you've got it, we can fill it, fill an aster or Phlox with that, for that space. All right, just waiting. Oh, Julie, okay, Phlox, I guess I gave it its own, its very own slide. So these are some of the different phloxes. The one I was talking about, um, that's the subdulata that I have that pictured in the upper right. It comes in white, pink, and purple, blue, fuchsia, all sorts of colors. The top left is the garden phlox that we all kind of know. Everybody's grandma grew it. Um, great, great one. And there's ones for shade, all sorts of them there. So just to give you a little bit of a, an idea of the phlox. So, We've got a, just over 15 minutes left. Are there any questions or have any questions come in? Hi, Julie, a couple of questions. Sure. When you show those ground covers, mm -hmm. you're showing them pretty much filling a whole space, but really what happens a lot of times is you plant, you plant them spaced out so that they can grow, but in the first one or two seasons, a lot of weeds grow in between there. What do you do about that? You mulch, like I think there, like I don't like mulch, but I do think there is a time and place for mulch. So mulch is great to help get plant, to help plants get established. So just mulch around them and you will have to pull weeds. I have a new area that I, I did last, late, late last summer and I pulled the weeds and I noticed all the winter weeds are in there now. I went out there yesterday to try and pull some, but the ground was still too hard. So I felt silly, uh -huh. but you know, you got a weed, it's, it's, you know, one of those necessary evils in life, but mulch will help out a lot with that. And when you buy mulch, I always just buy the cheapest mulch I can find. I don't buy any of the colored mulch, the blacks, the reds, the browns, because that's a chemical that they put in there. And that chemical ultimately leaches into our ground and our water source. Mm -hmm. But, you know, just cheap mulch does the trick. It breaks down eventually. Uh, I know a lot of people like uh, leaf leaf compost or leaf manure, leaf mold, it goes by a whole bunch of different names. Um, and that's great. I think that's a really good ground cover, but it breaks down quick. So I usually will rotate in my beds that need mulch. I'll put down the leaf grow one year and then a hardwood the next year because the hardwood just lasts so much longer. Um, but the leaf mulch is really good. It's so um, dense in organic nutrients, you can't beat it, so. Okay. Um, someone's asking, what is a good ground cover that blooms early for the bees? So the Packer Aurea is an early blooming ground cover. The uh, Moss Phlox is a good early blooming ground cover. Those are probably my two favorites. Uh, Zizia, Zizia Aurea or Golden, oh, I can't think of the name now. Golden Alexanders, that's what it is. That is, it's a neat plant. It has really unique shaped leaves. It blooms earlier in the spring and it is the host of these uh, tiger swallowtail. And those are the caterpillars that you usually see on your dill and parsley. So if you have a problem with those caterpillars munching down your dill and parsley in your garden, plant some zizia arias around and they would more than likely go to that before they go to those other plants. Okay, Soraya, did you have a question? I've just unmuted your microphone. Oh, sorry, I forgot. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> okay. If you remember, let us know. Okay, thanks. Sure. Um, someone's wanting to know if you, or the website that you showed for Loudoun County, if there's one similar for Frederick County mapping. Are you aware of that? That I don't know. Um, you know, my I've looked for it if my parents and my sister both live in other counties, not in, even in Virginia, and I have not been able to find one for their counties either. Um, those are the only other places I'll go and help people with their yards. 
Yeah. And I've never seen one as robust as the one for Loudoun County. And they update their images every year. So you can get satellite or I guess they're airplane, but they're really good quality images. So I've never seen anything that really even comes close to, to ours. We're really lucky here. So sorry, Frederick County. <sighs> okay, that's all the questions for now, Julie. Thank you. Okay, oh, nope. oh, oh. Wait. Hold on a second. <laughs> Someone's trying to clarify when planting natives, it is best not to amend the soil. So I usually tell people, no, they don't need to amend the soil because those plants have evolved over time and they know how to grow in our Virginia clay. It's what they like. It's how they grow best. However, if you're in a neighborhood or a new development where they have at one point scraped off the the um, topsoil and you're left with this builder clay from deep down that's not doesn't have the uh, topsoil like we normally have you can amend it and you can use compost or worm castings or even leaf mulch is great if you live in Leesburg you can get the free Tuscarora landscapers choice um, it's like a soil amendment or soil conditioner you can put that in with your plants that's really helpful um, it also has a smell to it that the deer don't like. So if you have deer problem, uh, you can plant it there. If it's close to your house, though, I wouldn't use it because it it, it does have a smell because it is made from um, from the waste treatment center. So you know you may not want to put that outside your bedroom window or something. <laughs> I have a couple of uh, more questions. Do you want to save them for the end or yeah. take them now? Nope. Nope, we're good. We're good. Okay, so hold on a second. Um, it's that one because another one came in. Okay, I got nervous when I heard Golden Alexander can be mistaken for its toxic cousin, Hemlock. Is it easy to tell them apart? So I'm not sure what the Hemlock is that you're talking about, so I can't really speak to that. But um, you can email me. My email address is on my website watermarkwoods.com and if you have um if you know the plant names more specifically i'm happy to help dig into it and and we can figure it out okay last question do you have any recommendations for a front yard in a picky hoa neighborhood i don't think i can get away with devil's walking stick <laughs> yeah it is that, a problem <laughs> it could be a problem <laughs> That's the one with spikes, I think. There, they can, that could be tricky, unless you don't really don't like your neighbors. Um, so my my, you know, I I hesitate to recommend cultivars, but you know, if if at all possible, plant the native straight species plant because it's the one that's genetically diverse. When you go with a cultivar plant, it is genetically identical to every other cultivated plant with that same name. However. Cultivars have a place, and I think if you're in an HOA that's very picky, it might be a good spot for that, such as um, bee balm, monarda, uh, you know, they're beautiful, but they can get kind of aggressive and spread around and look weedy, and sometimes they flop if you don't plant them with other things. Um, I have some, I, and I love them, the straight species, but there's some cultivars out there like um, monarda purple rooster and um, Monarda Garden View Scarlet that stay tighter and more compact and they look more managed. So I think rather than planting something that's not native to here and supports zero wildlife, plant one of those cultivars. It's not as great as a straight native species, but it's still pretty good and it'll still support quite way more wildlife than something that's not from here. So, I mean, there's and there's a lot of cultivars out there, you know, so you can usually find something to fit that would fit in the spot in your nice manicured thing. That said, Plant Nova Natives does work with HOAs um, in helping to educate some of their review boards to amend um, the covenants, to encourage more native plantings. Um, Willisford is a good example of that. Uh, Sycamore Hill here in Leesburg is another really good example of using natives in a managed area. They have it in front of their clubhouse. So there's ways to do it. Even uh, Belmont, uh, they've done some amazing native plantings. 
you know, and, and that's a very upscale neighborhood where you would think that they would be a little more uh, restrictive in what they allow you to plant, but they're embracing it. It's more and more HOAs are, are getting on the bandwagon and Plant Nova Natives is working towards um, helping HOAs to be more, uh, more up with the times. Any other questions? No, that's it for now. All right. Uh, when does when do you open in spring? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's always a, an interesting question. Um, so we usually we say we're open April first through just October thirty first. Uh, with the way the climate has been. Um, it's been getting warmer and warmer and we've been opening a little earlier and earlier and we don't really publicize it a whole lot, but I will update the calendar on the front page of our website. Last year we opened March 15th. Um, I think this year we may have a few days around the 15th, but we will probably be open our regular hours, maybe around the 21st or so of March, but I think, uh, I think we're going to be opening earlier because, you know, once the weather gets warm, we all want to get out there, you know. And when is the shrub sale? Oh, <laughs> so uh, we we're going to do a couple shrub sales this year. It just got to be overwhelming for us last year. If you saw the pictures of how many shrubs and trees came in, it, I mean, it's it like in the thousands and we're just, you know, six or eight workers here. So it's crazy. So we're going to do what I'm going to, my goal is to publish it this third week of March for an April, first week of April to be picked up. And then I'm going to try and do another one towards the end of April. And then we'll do it again in the fall once or twice, depending how, how things are looking. And then if you look at Plant Nova Natives website again, they also post lists of when uh, native plant sales are in the area. So, you know, there's a big one um, in Alexandria, uh, Earth Sangha, which is a native plant vendor in Springfield, they do a big sale. So there's, you know, they pull together the dates of all those sales and put it, uh, publish them so you can see where, where else you can buy native plants. Because we, I mean, I think hands down, we have the best selection, but you know, every every place has something that's a little bit different and you might be looking for something or find something cool everywhere else. I, I myself buy plants from other vendors all the time. Okay, that's it for now. All right. All right. Well, so then in closing, I just want to encourage everybody to plant more natives. And if you don't have any natives, just plant one. There's Doug Tallamy uh, is trying to have this push and there's, I think there's a Facebook group for it called the National Backyard National Park. And if we all planted one native plant, you know, that's gajillions of native plants, you know, all across the world. So, um, but a couple things to keep in mind uh, next week on Wednesday with the library, we're going to have another garden talk and it's going to be maintaining your native plants, um, or as I like to call it tips for a lazy gardener. So uh, that one should be fun because I think more and more people are planting native plants and now we're like, well, how do I take care of them? What do we do now? When do I clean this up? And then um, kind of my personal project with Loudoun Wildlife Conservancy is the birdhouses of Loudoun County. And there's in the picture, you can see some of the birdhouses and this year we have a few rain barrels as well. And you can get more information on the Loudoun Wildlife website. And it's going to be a, an auction February 21st through the 28th. You can bid. So please log in there and bid. And, and I made one of the houses as well, but it's all local artists. And we also partner with the Arts for All program, which is the adult special needs artists at Franklin Park. They've done several uh, birdhouses and one of the rain barrels as well. So um, check that out. And I think that is the end of my talk. So except there's one more question. Excellent. <laughs> if I plant pussy willow canes, how closely together should I plant them? So pussy willows can get to be about 20 to 25 feet tall and 15 to 20 feet around. Um, they are they have shallow roots, so you can prune them back really hard and heavy, but they'll send up suckers as well. 
So it just depends how long you want to wait. Uh, I planted one that was enough pussy willow for me. But if you wanted them to fill in really fast, you could you could plant them five feet apart and they'll just grow together and then you'll have this full on pussy willow hedge. Uh, if you want them to look more defined, then plant them 20 feet apart. So it, it's, a, I guess, a little bit of your personal preference as well. Okay, that's awesome. Thank you, Julie. No problem. Any other questions? Uh, okay. If there was one beautiful native small plant or bush that's colorful, maybe long blooms and deer resistant to help a person fall in love with natives, what would it be? Okay, that that answer changes based on what week it is. Uh, and so this week, I would say a vine, I would say um, the Lonaceris semper virens or coral honeysuckle, which it, it's our native honeysuckle. It has bright fuchsia pink flowers with a yellow throat. And the reason I say this week it's my favorite is because this week I had a flower on mine. So it's evergreen it will bloom you know it's very unusual to have a bloom but it seems like every year in the winter i get one or two flowers which is so cool but the, it's a hummingbird magnet they love it it's a easy to grow vine it can grow in full shade it's not always happy it won't bloom very heavy and will only last four or five years in the shade but in the full-on sun it'll last forever and can grow like crazy you can cut it all the way to the ground and it'll grow maybe six feet in a year. Um, and then if I wanted, so not a vine, um, a herbaceous plant. I think my favorite is phlox subdulata, that low growing evergreen phlox. Uh, I've got it up by our, our sign at the road and I have it in a bunch of different colors and it's filling in, it chokes out the weeds. I, you know, I, every summer I pull a piece of grass out of it but it is just so pretty in the summer, in the spring with all those different colors. And then in the summer, it's got this really almost prickly foliage. It just, I think it's pretty all year round. And right now I was out there getting the mail this week today and you know, it's got kind of a reddish tinge to it, but it's still green, it's still pretty and it's hardy and it's up there where it gets salt spray, it's beautiful. Okay. Uh, do you sell skunk cabbage? <laughs> so when I have skunk cabbage, um, I'll sell it. It's a really tricky plant to grow from seed, and it's also hard to transplant it. So um, I do know there's a guy, um, Sunshine Farm and Gardens. He's in West Virginia, a very He's a really colorful guy. He's a lot of fun. Um, he'll sell it, and I think he sells it through his website. Um, but it can be expensive because it's so hard to grow. But it's it is a cool plant. Okay. Well, as one person said, thank you so much for your expertise. Um, thank you, thank you, thank you, Julie. <laughs> that was so great, so useful. Thanks. And hopefully, no you've inspired people across Loudoun County. To plant more next trees. Next week on the sixteenth, you can bring more questions. <laughs> <laughs> and we'll see you next week. I'm glad you'll be back. Please yes. join us then, everybody. Julie Thank will be you. back next Wednesday. All right. Have a good night. Bye bye, everyone. <laughs>